in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amin. I, I, I want to speak to you about something that is not in the scripture that we just prayed. And it's why I prayed it rather quickly, because you're familiar with this. A person who is demon-possessed, blind and mute, is brought to Jesus. He heals them. He heals him. I, them is also correct because there is something inside him which is not him. That is the possession of the demon. But the point that I'm making is that we, we all know how this story goes. They're jealous. They accuse him of being in league with a greater demon who, with his assistance, that means the assistance of the greater demon, he's able to cast out this person. And you, you know, you know the story very well. So I don't want to speak about this. I want to look at from the beginning of chapter 12. Now in chapter 12, Jesus is accused of violating the Sabbath because his, he and his disciples are hungry and they're walking through the fields of grain and they are plucking some of the heads of the grain from uh, that which grows in the field and eating it. So the, the Jews accuse him of harvesting. Harvesting is a sin. Harvesting is a sin. But to pluck a few grains, it's not a sin. You know, to pass a, a, a tree that is bearing fruit on the Sabbath day and to take a piece of the fruit and to eat it on the Sabbath day is not a sin. But to, har to harvest all of the fruit would be a sin. So this is, they're being very, very technical with him. And, and what does he say? He says, do, do, you, do you accuse the, the same violation of the Sabbath of the priests in the temple as you as you do me are, are, do, you, do you remember David he and his uh, men were hungry and they came to the temple and there wasn't anything for them to eat so the priest gave them the showbread he had only one um, proviso and that was that they had been away from women, that they hadn't, there hadn't been any marital act in more than 24 hours to give them this holy bread. And David assured the priest that his men had been with him for this period of time, and he knew that they were, that, that, that they were chaste. But the, the, the delicate point is, is that do you realize that the Sabbath was very strictly held by people who wanted to make other individuals' lives rigorous, tough, hard. But what about the priests in the temple? What did the priests in the temple do on, 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 on the Sabbath? Did they not slaughter animals? And did they not make a holocaust of all of that which was offered on the fire? Did they not, in, in fact, on the Sabbath build the fire? Did they not, when it was required, circumcise a child on the Sabbath? Yes, they did all of these things. He's all these things. And Jesus is reminding them from the prophet Hosea, chapter 6, verse 6, that I, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So that was the first thing. Remember, we're, we're just dealing with chapter, chapter 12. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I, I gave you like the first eight, nine verses. But that's not all. Now... The Pharisees are trying to trap him. And so they, they know his kindness. They know his generosity, which far exceeds their own. So a man is brought in to the synagogue where he is teaching. And the man has a withered hand. A withered hand. 
and they say, is it lawful to heal on the, on, on, on the, on the Sabbath? You're doing work. But Jesus, being Jesus, and, 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 and this, this, is, this is what is stunning for me sometimes. You know the, the three cases of, of the Lord raising the dead. First he's in the room with the little girl Tabitha, and he, he's handling the little girl. Then the, the widow, of the, who, who, whose son, whose only son has, has died, he simply touches the coffin, the beer, B-I-E-R. And then in the last case, Lazarus, just, just a word, just a word. So in each case, very gently, he's leading him to the inexorable conclusion that he's God. So this man has a withered hand. You know, some people say that he is, he is like the Jews in the sense that he's no longer able to do that which he was made to do. They are no longer in service of the temple, but they are in service of themselves. So he, he heals this man's hand. And they, they castigate him and he says, is there anyone among you who, if his animal falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not remove the animal from the pit? Or we will have the animal cry during this time. And sometimes, you know, we, being in the suburban life that we have, we, we don't hear animals cry very often. But sometimes I hear dogs whimper. They're, they're, they're brought outside and they want to be inside the house and they whimper. And it's a very, very terrible thing to hear. But you should know that farm animals also do these things. They, they, they don't maybe have the appeal of the cute little domesticated dog that we have. But for somebody whose livelihood depends upon the interaction with these animals, to hear this, it, it, you, you can't. You can't be human and, and tolerate that sound. You have to help. Jesus had to solve the problem with this man's hand. He had to. And when you then find that someone is being brought to him, and it's someone who's demon-possessed, the fathers of the church uh, conclude unanimously that they're talking about the Gentiles. Because, now, how do you tell when someone's demon-possessed? Right? How, how, how do you tell that? If you just come upon someone, you don't know. But if you have known them before the possession, and then possession takes place, you can clearly see the difference between the two states of being. So it's not just that he was blind and mute, which means he could not see his creator, nor could he pray to his creator. He could not see any of these things. He was completely helpless, as the Gentiles were, not having, not having been given all that the Jews had received. Now, if, if you look and see what Matthew himself says about this. Because as he's relating the narratives of, of these events, the three events that I've just stated, the, the, the plucking of the, the grain, the healing of the, or the withered man's hand, and the last one, making the man who is blind and mute see and hear. He adds, he adds something else. This is from the the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 42. He says, what, what do you expect your Messiah to be like? He's not going to be yelling in the streets. He is so gentle that a bruised reed he will not break. And a smoking flax, that's the wick that they used in their oil lamps. A smoking flax he will not extinguish. He's so gentle and he's so mild. And 
they've missed the entire point of Sabbath. Sabbath was given to man and he was told not to work, not because work is inimical to God's creation, but because it was going to be a day upon which reflection upon God himself and man's relationship to his creator would take place. I want to give you one day out of the week where you do nothing else but think about your God and your relationship to your God and the way in which he serves you. Mothers typically do most of the serving in homes with little kids. Their, their bodies are suitable for this. As they grow older and they no longer are nursing but weaned from their mother, then fathers have more interaction. But the ones who created the child, the mother and the father, they serve the child. And all of these symbols are supposed to point to the feelings that we should have towards our Creator, our Father who art in heaven. And so he gave us this day. But the day wasn't, oh, you're going to go to hell because you're carrying a burden. You know, even today the Jews have decided that you may carry no more than four ounces or you're doing work. And you are violating the Sabbath if you are a halakhic Jew. Ultra-Orthodox may be the word that you are more familiar with. But to be a halakhic Jew, to obey the very letter of the law, you may not, you may not do anything. You realize that they have a person who lives next to every Orthodox synagogue who is a, a goy, a non-Jew, right? Who has the key to open up the synagogue because they may not use the key to open up their own house of worship on their day of worship because it would be violating the Sabbath. They do not turn lights on. They do not cook. Every woman will have the meal prepared prior to sundown on Friday night. All of these things are done to make sure that they do not violate the Sabbath literally, but they forgot even in this time of the Lord Jesus Christ that the Sabbath was simply made for reflection, for meditation, to embrace all of the good and to recognize it in a congregation about how much our Creator has done for us. So it's not just this, this story, you know, that, that um, Jesus is castigated by the Jews saying, by the power of Beelzebub you cast out lesser demons. And even then, how does our how does our Savior respond? He responds with such gentleness, such sophistication and delicacy. He says, okay, if I'm casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, your children, your children, how are they casting out demons? Of course the Jews were silent. They're going to speak against their own children and their own children have the acclaim of the entire populace. All of the people have given witness that these things that are happening through his disciples, through the children of the Jews, are magnificent. And we've never seen such things. We've never heard of such things. And they're occurring in our midst with great frequency. What then are the Pharisees going to say? But Jesus doesn't say, 
I'm judging you. He's saying, they, they will be your judges. And truly it is that the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel will sit on thrones and judge Israel itself. They will judge. Because now they see the radiant power of God and now they know the certainty of everything that comes next. This, this chapter was so, so brilliantly written. And, and I, I'm using this word because it brings light to so many other things. How many times has it been in your life that people have suggested that you change some habit of yours? Suggested. As opposed to, if you don't change what you're doing, I'm going to punch you square in the nose. When someone is vociferous and when somebody who is, 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 is very aggressive tells you, you will do this or you will leave. You will do this or we will separate. You will do this or I will fire you. You will do this. Remember the masks? Remember how many of you were wearing masks? I still see people in their cars by themselves wearing masks. Tell me if I'm wrong. You never saw me, except when Syedna was here. I'm not going to, I'm not going to confront him because that gives you the wrong impression of my feelings towards him. I have great respect for him, but he was wrong. And I was right. But that aside, when somebody makes a suggestion to you, do you listen to it? Most of the time, no, because it requires some action on your part. But you see how gently Jesus in each one of these things, he doesn't say, I have the right to eat from the grains of wheat because I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I have the right to heal this man's hand because I made this man in his entirety. And I remove the burden of the demonic possession of this third man because I have trampled down death by my incarnation my very incarnation. And when the disciples came back to him saying, we found that the demons were subject to us in your name, he said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. But he didn't say that, did he? He didn't say any of those things. You know, if I were Jesus, boy, this world would be a lot different. This world would really be black and white. But Jesus was so, so loving and so kind. And he kept doing this. Now, some people think when someone is being kind that there's not going to be an end point. But there is an end point. And that is why there is hell. And Jesus will be kind and he will be conciliatory up until your last breath. But you better find a way for reconciliation before your last breath. Because after that, there is only hell. There is no more mercy. You are experiencing the mercy of God now in your members. Now. And the way that you can work on your own to assure yourself of a place in heaven is to confess and I know people don't confess regularly. I know this. And it is a great folly. It's foolishness. It's stupidity. If you do not confess, you're not going to be able to say at the end of your life, oh, well, you know, now I realize 
uh, too late. His kindness, as I've shown you, demonstrated in the 12th chapter of the book of Matthew, gives all the indications of the complexity of his care, the delicacy of his care. But there will be, as it says in the book of Revelation, coming out of his mouth a two-edged sword. Don't forget that. A two-edged sword coming out of the sweetest mouth that was ever made. Huh? Think about these things. I reflect on them, and that's why I wanted to bring them to you today. Glory be to our God, both now and ever, unto the age of all ages. Amen.